So I'm here with Michelle Brush at OSCON, and Michelle gave what I thought was a really great talk, kind of putting uh, her work with data at Cerner in context. So I guess I start, start off with um, kind of how you started off, like what, academically and how you got into uh, a data role. Uh, so I had a computer science degree in undergrad. I kind of fell into that accidentally because I started out as pre-med and <laughs> decided that I really did not like biology too much. It was more memorization and less problem solving. So I looked for an opportunity that would allow me to do more problem solving and flipped over to computer science and fell in love with it. Uh, so when I was getting out of school, I looked for a company that would allow me to marry my interest in the medical side of things with the development side of things and ended up at Cerner where we do healthcare software. Great. And coming from computer science, where did you get the kind of, it sounds like you do a lot of analytics. Where did you get the kind of analytic background? I've always been a math lover. I was um, on the math team in high school, and so anytime I get to use math as part of my field, I, I love it, and I try to bring more and more of it into it as much as possible. And so uh, analytics, analysis of data, those are areas where you do get to use a lot of heavy math. Great. So one of the things I really liked about your talk is that your themes, uh, to me, really resonated with how I do my work. Do you mind just kind of going over, like, kind of the high-level themes that you discussed? Yeah, so my talk was about how when we're making technology decisions, we don't do it fully informed. Uh, we're not machines, we're humans, and we have our own biases. And as a result, sometimes we make imperfect decisions. Um, it may be the best decision we can make for who we are at that moment and the information we have, but how can we do it better? And I look to behavioral economics and some of the studies they've done around choice as a means to find a solution to that problem. And so one of the things that I looked at is, well, with the explosion of open source as well as all the technologies and stacks and languages we now have available to us, do we have too much choice? And should large organizations like the one I work for uh, find ways to structure choice so that it helps people more efficiently and more effectively make decisions? That's, that's great. We have a chart that shows what we call the data pipeline. Uh -huh. and we have all the vendors, and vendors loosely <laughs> because so many are open source projects. Yeah. I believe there are over 70 different things yes. underneath it. Yes. Right? And it's like we have to try to keep up with it. No. It's even hard to keep up, never mind use them. Yeah, exactly, and and there's all sorts of trade-offs that you make. You know, one, one technology will give you higher availability and the next one will give you um, better consistency, or one will increase your time to market, but you make trade-offs other, other places, and each individual problem that you're solving tends to prioritize different attributes, and so it's, it's a really expensive process to make a fully informed decision. Right, one of the things that I've noticed, and I've been doing data warehouse days and working with data even before then for a pretty long time. I almost feel like people are reinventing stuff that has already <laughs> happened. I wonder if you get a sense of, of that as well. Yeah, it's it's funny. I think as people, anytime we perceive friction, whether that's real or not, we, we sometimes run off and, and go do something um, completely different and spend all these resources reinventing the wheel out of this perceived friction that may or may not have been there. And I've seen that in technology a lot because you'll find an API or a platform that is 90% or maybe 80% of what you need and then people have the tendency to overvalue that last 10 or 20% and say, okay, well, I need to rebuild something. Right. And that is the nice thing about uh, our, the industry's move to more and more open source is that uh, the, the decision to go ahead and enhance something existing has become easier. But even then, I still see individuals perceive this incredible hurdle to even enhancing an open source project and they run off and build yet another framework to do the same thing. Right, yeah, it, it is kind of funny and me being in the Bay Area, we see that <laughs> kind, of, uh, yeah. kind of in spades. Yeah. Um, you, you talk about bias, and you talk about like behavioral economics, but for, for someone like kind of listening to this, is there like a few things to both like acknowledge bias and, and, and how do you instill that in your team so that they know what to do about it? You know, oddly enough, I think awareness is a, a really huge part of it. Uh, that was something that 
a lot of people didn't really understand why they're making the choices they're making and when I would talk to the architects on my team and I would walk them through you know why are we making this decision and a lot of it when we actually talked through where they got the idea that they should use a particular technology like Storm or Kafka or whatever it happened to be they would say well we thought everybody else was using it so it was this weird sort of peer pressure and they but it took us a long time to get to the point where they admitted that was behind it or somebody else uh, might uh, told me once it was because well this just sound really interesting and they wanted to learn it you know they wanted to be able to be the person that was the the expert on that technology in our company and we we had to talk through how that's not a good way to value a technology <laughs> we have to look at more and more variables than that and so that awareness really helped them but I think even going beyond that, um, another way to help with it is, to, is checklists. I mean, that seems to be, it's so pedestrian, it's so plain, but anytime you see that uh, people are making the wrong decisions, you know, you, you put a checklist in place and say, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? You're not restricting their decision making, you're just making sure that they are thinking through all the things they need to consider. Yeah, I, I mean, I totally agree, and yeah. I think that, certainly when I read uh, Atul Gawande's article about checklists and yeah. hospitals and how much that helped. Yes, that. yes. <laughs> and that's a more pressurized situation that it probably yeah. is worth it in other, in other areas. I also think that sometimes uh, analysts in particular tend to be pretty good at focusing on things. Mm -hmm. Without a checklist, they f forget yeah. that there's a bigger, a bigger kind of world. Yeah. Well, since you talked about um, bias and you talked about using behavioral economics, I'm wondering, like, for the analytics work your team does, do you bring in any social science? Do you do anything from design to like help kind of address the questions you're trying to answer? Uh, not yet. <laughs> it's probably something we should be uh, doing more and more, but not at this time, yeah. Okay. Um, and as you talk about this and making decisions stuff, I'm curious, how big a team do you have? And I have a 35-person team, roughly. Wow. Yes. So that's, a, that's a pretty big... <laughs> it is a big team. Yeah. Uh, it, it's interesting, though, because it's divided into the individuals that are working on the, the data and pulling the data in and normalizing it and standardizing it. But another part of the team I have is actually culture. And they are a group of individuals that are looking at how do we spread this good decision-making behaviors, how do we spread the value system that we want all of the development community to have within our organization. And so from that standpoint, we, we get really interesting work as part of that. So we've done a lot with gamification, we've done a lot with um, data collecting and visibility and trying to kind of steer the, the social you know, culture of the company through that team. Wow, so how many people do you have dedicated to that? Uh, that's just four. That is <laughs> fascinating. You know, yeah. I, we, I've talked about that a little bit even in a small company like O'Reilly. Yeah. Um, that's really interesting. And do you think that other people in the company are kind of valuing that you're providing this kind of input? Yeah, uh, we we have done a lot of uh, really interesting work as part of that team. Uh, in the beginning, we, we really focused heavily on conference strategy. So how do we get more people going to conferences? How do we get more people speaking at conferences? And then also we built our own internal conference to kind of bring everyone together to, to celebrate the technologies we're using and cross-pollinate ideas. Uh, and then we moved on and we started doing, okay, we need more frequent, smaller gatherings of people. So we started doing internal meetups. We started a tech talk series. So, um, but what we moved on now is even trying to get some more of the development strategy to be more of a cultural initiative. And so we're looking at open source as a cultural problem and how do we, and not that open source is a problem, but how do we get people to engage more with it right. as a cultural problem. And so uh, we've got, we're taking the same playbooks that we did for everything else and we're applying it to that space now. Wow. So how is the meetup community in uh, Kansas City and how much do you guys participate? It seems like that would be another way to get outside. Yeah. No, we, we actually participate pretty heavily, and I was pleasantly surprised with Kansas City. Uh, a lot of times we look to the, you know, the coasts and we say, okay, well, we're not, we're not there yet. You know, we've got a long ways to go to get there. But when we started looking around the Midwest, uh, other cities in the areas, we actually were doing surprisingly well. We have a large number of meetups, uh, anyway from functional programming to Java and Ruby, um, you know, Node, you name it, we probably have a meetup group for it. I am a meetup organizer for Girl Development in Kansas City. And so there's tons of organizations that we're doing. And then my company, Cerner, we try to sponsor as many of those as we can, you know, just provide the food. We try to have our, our associates heavily involved as organizers or as speakers. We let them use our space. So. Mm -hmm. That's great. So it sounds like not only you're doing it internally, but you're helping yes. more broadly in the community. But I'm guessing that means that you also then get more 
information about what other people yeah, are no. doing that's helpful. You know, and it has like it has very clear measurable benefits. Like we've we've met people and, and been able to get them interested in our company and come work for us through that interaction. But also the the more subtle benefits is that we get the ideas that are there. We get our associates bringing those back into the corporation and, and applying it to our software. Mm -hmm. Well, this is great. I mean, I think you're really doing an interesting job, and I think anyone listening to this would probably be interested <laughs> to know that it's not just about whether random forest is better than support vector machines, but that there's <laughs> a lot bigger things going on yeah. in looking at data, and that open source plays a big, a big part of it. So yeah. thanks a lot for yeah, talking to us you. today. All right, great. thanks.